Um, I've, been, I've been doing this soapbox for quite a long time. I remember I, I did it in 2006, and it's always great to be back here. It's great to be back at the fair. I know that uh, every politician uh, who comes here says that, but the fact of the matter is, in 1969, that was my first state fair. I'm a native Iowan. I grew up in Sioux City and went to Iowa State. And you know, I mean, I'm, I've lived all but six years of my life in Iowa. But uh, in the summer of 69, one of my best friends from, my, uh, from high school and I, uh, going into our senior year, we camped out in a tent up on the hill over here. And it was pretty hot and humid. And there were a lot of people partying for a long time up there, too. But then I remember the Varied Industries building, too, before Bill Knapp decided to fix it up. Uh, it was like one big barn, folks. It wasn't what it is now. It wasn't air conditioned, right? So anyway, I have a long history with the State Fair, and it is really good to be here today, and I thank the Register for doing this. Um, you know, I, I often uh, talk about how uh, my background informs a lot of who I am today and why I do what I do in the Congress and why I vote the way I do in the Congress. I do have 24 counties now, for those of you who don't know, and about 765, 775,000 folks. There's a lot of different groups in that and a lot of different folks in that district. I mean, it's a big district. You know, I stretch from Lamoni all the way up to Clinton. So think about how big of an area that is. And uh, try to represent that many people, it's always a challenge. Um, but at the same time, a lot of, as I said, a lot of what I do now is informed by how I grew up in Sioux City. And, you know, I often talk about growing up with my, my mom was a single parent. She had an 11th grade education. She struggled with mental illness her whole adult life. And I wasn't fortunate enough to enter the middle class, actually, until I got the job at Cornell College. And so I was not exactly young then. I was 29 years old when I got that job at Cornell College. But I was able to, to get where I am today because of my own hard work. Um, I decided very young that I was not going to stay poor my entire life and that if I had a chance to go to college and work hard and do the things I needed to do, that that's what I was going to do. Because to be quite honest, if when you're in poverty, it's really not much fun, folks. Um, just so you know, I got to remind people of that sometimes. It's not fun to be poor. But I was fortunate enough to be able to do that. But I had a lot of help along the way, too. My high school principal came to me when I was a senior. And he knew about the family situation, and he said, I know you're going to Iowa State, but we got this uh, janitor's job this summer if you want to take this job. And you can work this job if you do well at it. You can do it every summer while you're at Iowa State. And I took him up on the offer, and that's what I did. That's how I worked my way through Iowa State. But my first full-time 40-hour-a-week job was that summer of 1969 when I was 16 years old and I was able to take a few days to come here. That was a federally funded program for so-called disadvantaged kids, folks. And what I did was I worked at the Sioux City Waste Treatment Control Plant, otherwise known as the Sioux City Sewage Plant. And I got myself up early in the morning and I drove my brother's 1960 Bel Air. I like to, I like to remember these days, you know, a three-speed on the column that burned more oil than it did gas, if you know what I'm talking about. And, and I got to work early, got up early, got to work early. I learned about responsibility. I learned about taking responsibility for myself. And I learned what hard work was all about. But that was a program that was provided to me. And then when I went to college, I was able to get grants and scholarships and low interest loans. I wouldn't have made it through Iowa State had it not been for those programs. And Social Security. My dad died when I was a senior in high school and my parents were divorced. But it didn't matter that they were divorced. I was able at that time to get Social Security survivor benefits so that I could get through Iowa State University so I could pay my way through Iowa State. So those are some of the reasons why I am who I am today and why I do everything I can to build up the middle class, protect the middle class, and also make sure that folks who are not in the middle class but want to get out of it and are willing to pull themselves up by their bootstraps and take responsibility for themselves, that they have the kinds of opportunities that I had when I went to Iowa State, that I had when I was young. Because there are people who care about people like that. But the middle class is what 
drives this country. The middle class, there are a lot of reasons why we're exceptional. But the middle class is one of the big reasons why the United States of America is an exceptional country, folks. And we need to do everything we can to protect and to expand and help the middle class and those who've never been in it, folks. We've got to do that. It's what it's all about. And it's about good jobs. Yes, we have an economic recovery, but that economic recovery isn't as strong as it should be. So we've got to deepen that recovery. We've got to get people back to work. We've got to focus on infrastructure, folks. We passed a five-year highway bill last year. Unfortunately, we didn't completely fund it yet. But that's infrastructure. Those are jobs that are in the United States that can never be exported from the United States. Infrastructure is the key in so many ways, folks. And education is the key to making sure that we have the workforce available so that we have the skilled workforce available for those jobs and for the manufacturing jobs that we know we can bring back here to America and that we can create in America. One other area of infrastructure that's often forgotten about or not thought about is broadband. Now, I know that a lot of you folks have probably had some issues from time to time with your internet, right? No matter who your carrier is. But rural America in particular, rural America in particular, has an issue with sufficient bandwidth and broadband. You know, I had a bunch of meetings January a year ago around my district talking about broadband. And at 2 o'clock in the afternoon in Centerville, Iowa, there were 27 folks there. Because they know that if they're going to get companies to come in, one of the first things, maybe the first thing that company's going to ask is what kind of bandwidth do you have here? Because folks need to have that kind of internet connection for economic development. And I've been working with Republicans across the aisle to make sure that we have the funding that we need to expand that broadband. I'm working with a guy who's the head of the National Republican Campaign Committee. His job is to get rid of all of us Democrats. I'm working with him to make sure that small internet service providers aren't overburdened with regulation so they can actually put their resources into expanding broadband in rural areas, folks. I just got a bill passed that would help skilled nursing facilities, those nursing homes in rural areas, and I did that with a Republican from New Jersey. We got that passed so that more funding is available out of the existing budget, not adding anything to the budget, not adding anything to the deficit, folks, so that those skilled nursing facilities have the resources so they can provide resource broadband for their folks in those nursing homes so that they can do FaceTime with their kids and their grandkids. And so those administrators can fill out the paperwork that they have to fill out. That's the kind of thing I'm talking about, folks, that's important for the middle class, whether it's rural or urban areas. That's the kind of stuff I'm working on, folks. Now, beyond that, I mentioned agriculture. Look, there are some folks who think that the renewable fuel standard is not the right way to go. There are some folks in Congress and outside Congress who don't like the government picking so-called winners and losers. Let me tell you, folks, if we had not had the renewable fuel standard in this country, or in this state, and in this country, Iowa farmers would be hurting much more than they are now, folks. We'd have thousands fewer people employed in ethanol and biodiesel plants if we didn't have that renewable fuel standard. And I don't care if it's a Democrat or a Republican in office, I will do everything I can to make sure that the next president of the United States works as hard as he and hopefully she will do to keep that RFS in place, folks, because that's economic development in rural America. We're going to do it. And on the energy front, while I'm talking about biodiesel and ethanol, you know, talk about picking winners and losers. Does anybody here think it's a bad idea that 31% of our electricity in Iowa is generated by wind? And would we even have that if it weren't for the production tax credit? No way we wouldn't have that, folks. We're on our way to 40% of our electricity generated by wind energy in Iowa. The production tax credit is absolutely critical, and I fought like heck to get five more years this time into that last year. And that's going to help the wind energy industry 
get on its feet and be able to compete with big oil, which, by the way, still gets breaks, and they shouldn't be getting those breaks, folks. They shouldn't be getting them. And solar, go to Washington County. It's not number one, but it's right up there in terms of hog production per capita, okay? Those big confinements, some people don't like those. I get that, all right? But those big confinements, more and more of those are being powered by solar energy. And they wouldn't be able to do that. It wouldn't be cost effective if it weren't for the investment tax credit, something I worked hard on to get five years more for that too this time around, folks. Very, very critical. A couple more things. Social Security and Medicare. This is a big issue. Not just because I'm 63, right? And I want to make sure that it's there for me. But I want to make sure it's there for all these folks out here. Adam, I want to make sure it's there for you. I want to make sure it's there for all these young folks out there. Because Social Security is a great program. It's 81 years old now, folks, okay? Yesterday, I believe, was its birthday. Very, very important. If you pay into Social Security, then you darn well better be able to get it back out after you pay it in. Don't you think so? Yeah. All right? You know, I mentioned I got to college because... because because of when my father died, I was able to get survivor benefits. In fact, in the fourth grade, when we moved in with my grandmother, we lived in three different places in the fourth grade. I often joke that I took a tour of the elementary schools in Sioux City. It wasn't intentional that year, right? But when we moved in, my grandma was receiving Social Security benefits because my grandpa had died. I wouldn't be here today if it weren't for those things, folks. But there are some who are saying, We've got to privatize it. We've got to turn that trust fund over to Wall Street and to those investors. Well, folks, I don't think that's a good idea. Do you? No, no way. And on Medicare, just think about this, all right? There are folks, Republicans in Congress, who want to turn Medicare over to the private insurance industry. Does anybody think it's a good idea that we turn Medicaid over to the private insurance industry here? I mean, there's no way, folks. Think about that. And then, well, maybe you get a voucher for five or $6,000, right? Well, anyone who's on Medicare knows that if you're 65, 66, 67 years old, that if you go out and try to buy an insurance plan that's as good as what you get on Medicare, and you say that, oh, I have $6,000 to pay for that, you know that's gonna be completely inadequate to pay for what you get on Medicare. So folks, not only do we have to fight privatization of Social Security, we have to do everything we can to make sure that we don't turn over Medicare to those private insurance companies as well. We've got to do that, folks. I want to, and I want to just say a couple things about, about sort of the political system as we know it today and really how pretty ugly it is out there, folks. You know, you hear it a lot from uh, your neighbors. You probably talk about it from time to time, just how ugly it is. We've seen what's happened at the presidential level. It's not a good thing for America that it has gotten so incredibly ugly out there in our political process. When I ran in 2006, my opponent and I, Jim Leach, I just looked it up again. Uh, November 4th, the Los Angeles Times in 2006 ran a story about how Jim and I were running against each other and we didn't say anything bad about each other, all right? In fact, I ran a commercial that said Jim Leach is a good man, okay? Well, we've seen what's happened since that time. It's just gotten uglier. And everything I hear when I go to the high V or when I'm at a Casey's because I'm on the road all the time, you know, or a come and go or whatever, what I hear is that people say, enough is enough. Enough of this partisan nonsense. Yes, I'm a Democrat. Yes, I want more Democrats in office because I think Democrats do better for the middle class. Thank you. But at the same time, hopefully I'll be reelected this time. You know, when I go back in January of next year, I'm gonna keep doing what I've done all along. And I'm gonna work with folks on the other side of the aisle. As I said, I did that with respect to broadband. I've done it with respect to the renewable fuel standard. I've done it on any number of issues because that's what people tell me they want me to do. They want me to work for them, not for the special interest, not for the party, all that other stuff. And they actually want us to get along. So, you know, I know a lot of folks on the other side of the aisle. I do the best I get to get along with them. I, I listen to folks 
you know, who aren't traditionally Democratic constituents and constituencies, and I work with them on a number of issues because it's the right thing to do. And I know that that's what you folks are yearning for as well. Yeah, you want a Republican or you want a Democrat or maybe you want a Libertarian, whatever the case may be. But from what I hear from you folks, you also want us to sit down when this is all over and figure out how to move the country forward. Is that what I'm hearing from you folks? I mean, that's... So, listen, folks, go out there and do what you got to do. You know, hopefully you're going to work hard to get me elected. I know not all of you are my constituents necessarily. But um, hopefully you're going to work hard to get me reelected. I'm looking forward to going back. I think we can get some really good things done here in this country. I think that, you know, I'm not a Pollyanna about this. But I think that when we go back in January, there's going to be such a critical mass of the American people who want us to do the right thing that I think most of the politicians, they know that that's true. But I have some optimism that we are going to be able to get things done and continue to do what we've done the last eight years, make sure that we deepen this economic recovery, get more people back to work, make sure we expand the middle class, protect those who are there, make sure we've got good jobs, make sure that we do everything we can to keep America safe from our enemies. We all want that and continue to do the right thing. Thanks, everybody. Thanks for being here. Really appreciate it. Thank you.